Congressman, welcome to today's briefing of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus presentation, H1N1, the swine flu, where we stand. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take a moment to um, thank some key um, people that make these caucuses possible. Um, this is our last caucus of the 2010 season, and I have to say, um, I think we have a tremendous year of briefings highlighting the exciting and cutting edge science taking place across the country. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus for providing a platform for these important and often, often timely briefings. In particular, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the co-chairs of the caucus, um, Representative Brian Bilbray from California, Mike Castle from Delaware, Jackie Spear from California, and Rush Hill from New Jersey all for their commitment and dedication to their ongoing support of the caucus. I'd also like to take an opportunity to thank the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which generally, generously supported the caucus through a grant. Um, the CLS is grateful for their continued support. Um, and I also want to point out that, as you can see, we do videotape every briefing. You can find past briefings on the CLS website at coalitionforlifesciences.org. You can register for an RSS feed in order to be alerted for future postings. So now without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Pa uh, Peter Police. Dr. Police is a professor of microbiology and chair of the Department of Microbiology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. He is a member of the National Academies of Science, and as a world-renowned virologist, he is a recipient of a multitude of awards based on his research on influenza viruses. He's here to talk with us today about the H1N1 flu. He'll discuss what we can expect this flu season. Um, he'll also discuss lessons learned from the uh, H1N1 outbreak of 2009, what he and his colleagues learned about the virulence factor and the spread of the infection. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to try to do today is to uh, explain the complexity of influenza viruses, specifically as it refers to the swine H1N1 influenza viruses, but also uh, what we can do about it in terms of vaccines and antivirals. So the disease influenza is caused by a virus. So this is an influenza virus in all its beauty. This is an electromicrograph. And you can see here uh, a couple of Okay. Uh, you can see here uh, on the inside the uh, genetic information that's like a mini chromosome, but it's RNA rather than DNA in this case. And there are uh, eight different RNA segments, one in the middle and seven, and seven around. And then there is a uh, lipid membrane and then some fuzzy thing on the outside. And that is what we refer to as the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, or hemagglutinin subtype 1 and neuraminidase subtype one. So that's what we, you have probably read in terms of H1N1, swine virus. There are many differences of these uh, hemagglutinins and many different of, the, different of these neuraminidases. Now, uh, a virus is very, very small. So this is blown up. It's obviously an electron micrograph. Does anyone have a feeling how big a cell would be which would be infected by this virus? How, how big would it be? Like this room, uh, the building, or... Anyone, any feeling about that? How, how big would be a cell which gets infected and after eight hours, 100,000 new virus particles are made and uh, that is what's causing the damage. So how big in relation would it be? Eight microns? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's about, it would be the size of, the, the, the number is correct, but if we sort of have it uh, uh, sort of magnify a cell uh, in relation to this influenza virus particle, it would have the size of about uh, a World Trade Center. So you can see this virus is very, very small. It infects the upper left corner of the World Trade Center, and within eight hours, 100,000 new virus particles are made, and uh, therefore the cell kills uh, the cell, and if it is a lung cell which gets killed, then, and not only one, but if uh, a third of the lung cells uh, get killed on the surface, then obviously uh, people can die of influenza. Now, another term which we have to understand is there is seasonal influenza and there is pandemic influenza. Seasonal means is what we regularly get during the winter season, and pandemic means 
It's a global epidemic. It, glo it goes all the way uh, all around the world. And pandemic influenza viruses are very famous in terms of 1918, most vicious uh, influenza uh, pandemic we had, but also we had uh, one in 1957, 1968. But even though we, I will talk mostly about pandemic influenza viruses, including the swine pandemic from last year, there is this uh, seasonal uh, influenza, and that is uh, also important, and we shouldn't underestimate the regular seasonal influenza uh, we have here, and these are CDC or WHO, World Health Organization numbers, where we can see that there are quite a lot of deaths uh, on average uh, per year. Uh, if we talk about the US, we have uh, more than 200,000 hospitalizations per year, which is actually quite a lot. And then the, these are very recent numbers from the CDC where uh, we can see that depending on the season, and here is sort of a low one where 3,000 people died, and if we talk about uh, in 2003, 2004, we had many more uh, people dying. So this is sort of uh, for us to understand that seasonal influenza is a problem, but more important is obviously when we have a pandemic and there is always an a economic cost associated with these influenza uh, outbreaks. Now, I said uh, influenza, there is a lot of complexity and the reason is that the virus constantly changes. So if one of the take home messages from what we are discussing today is, remember it is varying, it is their variance, it is changing. So this continuing change in influenza is important. In contrast, for example, to measles virus, which stays the same. Over the last 50 years, there was no change. Smallpox is not changing. But in terms of influenza, we have a continuous change. And so if we look at this a little bit in more detail, we, can, uh, we look at the influenza viruses which have been circulating in the human population. And I start here, and there are sort of A, B, and C uh, influenza viruses which are different. They all come from a common uh, ancestor. Some of us believe in Darwin, in, in, in evolution. So uh, there is one uh, sort of... Um, precursor of these different influenza viruses, and the most important ones are the influenza A viruses, but there are also influenza B viruses which can cause disease. And what we are looking at here is in 1918, there was this uh, Spanish flu, which probably most of us have heard about, and uh, this virus belonged to the H1N1 uh, type and uh, started in 1918. The first influenza viruses go back which we have in the laboratory uh, from 1933, and that's why we have a broken line here. Then there was a different outbreak in 1957, as I mentioned, H2N2, a different subtype, and then in six, so this is Asian flu and Hong Kong flu, 1968. And then H1N1 reappeared, and then very strange, as you, and we will talk about this much more, uh, a new pandemic H1N1 virus emerged last uh, April. So this is fairly complex, and particularly if you also have influenza B virus, uh, again, uh, this is in the 40s, the first isolates, but uh, not only do these viruses change in terms of their hemagglutinin, where we have a different, what we refer to as subtype from H2 to H3, but even uh, from year to year, the blue H3 and 2 are changing, the B viruses are changing, and the H1 and 1 viruses are changing. And that's sort of really uh, important, and that uh, in a sense that we are dealing here with a sort of abundance of different strains. And so if we look, for example, uh, in the year 2000, we have an H1 and 1, we have an H3 and 2, and we have a B virus. And last year, as you will remember, as you probably remember, we had actually four different strains. We had a B, an H1N1 pandemic, H3N2, uh, regular, regular seasonal H1N1. So what made it one, two, three, uh, four different strains. Now, uh, the seasonal influenza, most people who get infected are not dying. However, and that's sort of what uh, people are in the, uh, the people in the business are afraid of is that we have something like 1918. And the 1918 virus was really different in terms of its virulence, in terms of its pathogenicity. And the best way, or one way, I think one very good way of 
showing what it is or what it was is looking at the life expectancy in the US, and this is both uh, males and females, and uh, in the year 1900, we, the average life expectancy was 47 years, 47 years. A female born in 2010 has a life expectancy of 80, so it's almost a straight curve, yeah, really very impressive. But the reason I show it is here we have an 11-year dip, and that was the influenza pandemic in 1918, November 1918, to about February of 1919. Yeah? In the US, we had about three quarters of a million deaths, worldwide 50, maybe even 100 million uh, people, okay? So that is what we are concerned about. Having a pandemic, a global epidemic, within a very short period of time, and causing a lot of morbidity, a lot of disease, a lot of mortality, a lot of uh, death. And I just want to, God bless you. Uh, I just want to mention also that this virus here uh, is we have actually, we can study this virus in the laboratory and it is based on material which was obtained from army soldiers who died in the 1918-1919 uh, pandemic. And based on the sequence, we were actually able in the laboratory to reconstruct this virus, this 1918 virus. And uh, that was uh, a paper and, uh, which appeared in 2005 in Science and uh, uh, most of the people are here from Mount Sinai, where we developed a technology that uh, we can make in the laboratory an influenza virus. And this virus we have studied over the last five years quite extensively in monkeys, in mice, in um, uh, chicken, uh, in, in many different animals. And we actually uh, found out that this virus really is a virus which is more virulent, as I said, uh, had, has a bigger punch than other viruses. And I show you one slide which uh, from our own laboratory, which makes it also uh, sort of clear in terms of uh, virulence of the 1918 virus in mice. And we are looking here at a mouse lethal dose 50. So we ask how many virus particles, infectious particles, do we need to kill out of five out of 10 mice or whatever number we have. So we're using here a Texas virus from 1991. That's a human isolate. And we need more than 10 to the six. So a lot of virus. And then we go right away down to here to the reconstructed virus, so the one which we uh, have in this uh, characterization of the reconstructed 1918 uh, virus. So that one uh, in red here, we only need 3.3 .3 logs. So that's about a thousand times, so less virus we need here in order to kill 50% of the mice as compared to a control by a regular H1N1 virus, which was isolated from a patient in 1991. And then you can see here a virus which has two genes. So these are these eight genes which, are, which I showed on this earlier slide, electromicrograph, where we saw these sort of uh, d uh, black dots in there. So if you have two of the uh, 1918 virus here, so it's uh, two uh, red ones and the remaining six ones are from the mellow less virulent virus, we have something in between. We need 4.7 logs rather than three or six. So this is really a thousand times uh, more virulent. And uh, we can do this uh, kind of experiment also in other uh, animals, uh, other, other animal systems. And uh, the numbers are slightly different there, but in essence uh, also, uh, let, me, let me just show you this. Here we look at chick embryos. So this is an embryo lethal dose 50. And here again, the same kind of viruses. Here the numbers are different. So this is a million times. We need a million times less virus to kill 50% of the chick embryos in this case here. So you can really see that this virus is a more virulent one. And that uh, has been also proven by the numbers, as I said before, where we had this major drop in uh, life expectancy. So and that's sort of what we all are sort of afraid of that such that the regular virus either is um, um, uh, changing into something like this or that by uh, mixing of these genes, there are all kinds of influenza viruses out there in birds, in reindeer, in whales, in uh, uh, pigs, obviously, uh, in horses, in dogs, and by sort of rearranging of these mini chromosomes here, that things may emerge which actually are equally or theoretically even more virulent than the 1918 virus. So that's sort of what 
what we in the field and, and, and people who study uh, this virus are afraid of, that either by mutation or what we call reassortment, where these genes are being taken from different influenza viruses in animals, be it birds, be it chicken, turkey, etc. And that we really can't predict uh, whether, for example, this virus, by making or acquiring five new mutations, that it would become something like this. And we really can't predict, OK? So that's sort of why I think uh, we have to be sort of worried and also uh, prepare and, 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 and uh, have vaccines and antivirals in place in case such uh, a change occurs. So there was probably, uh, some of you probably will remember we had uh, a scare of another pandemic about 10 years ago, and that was the avian influenza. This was an H5N1, okay? So that instead of having uh, the hemagglutinin in your meat, there's an H1N1, this was an H5N1, and we may probably remember this sort of, this was 1997, and it, um, started out in Asia, where a lot of birds died. So this is a, an avian influenza virus, in essence, an H5N1. And uh, what it did was it uh, killed, actually, a lot of birds. And uh, the numbers are really that over a billion birds either died of uh, H5N1 infections or had to be culled, had to be uh, killed in order to sort of quarantine and 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 prevent the spread of um, uh, the H5N1 virus. And uh, fortunately, as you probably know, we do not have H5N1 in this country. So we do not have the virulent H5N1. So this white means uh, there are no uh, examples in either nature, nature or in chicken or turkey farms where this H5N1 has been found. However, as we said, uh, it started out in Asia and went into Europe and also a large, uh, uh, and not, not everywhere where it's reported in, in Africa. So we believe actually uh, more countries than shown here have experienced a virulent H5N1. And uh, also some people uh, have been affected and these are actually the official numbers by the uh, WHO where we have here the countries and the number of cases. So these are all hospitalizations. And uh, the number which uh, is given is about 500. So this was from last month. And uh, there were 300 deaths in humans. Now, in all cases, however, uh, these people here had direct contact with chicken. So uh, this is not a disease which is jumping from <coughs> one, by my coughing, from one person to the other, but rather this is only when, I believe, large quantities of virus. So if you sleep with a chicken in the same room, okay, you get large numbers of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. And that is not the case even if you go into the New York subway. Uh, we, even if someone is there having H5N1, we would probably not getting the dosage which is necessary. So this virus is, if you are a chicken, this virus is very dangerous. However, in humans, only uh, when large quantities and you really have to be in close contact. So each of these people here who died and who were hospitalized had direct contact with chicken. And therefore, this virus is H5N1 virus was something which concerned us a lot. And particularly, as I said, if you're a chicken, it should even today, but this virus is not a human uh, virus. It, is not, it doesn't have the ability to be transmitted from one person to the other. And that's sort of knock wood. So far, so good. And we, are, we have been spared, really, a pandemic. The idea, or well, the fear again here was that uh, changes three, five, maybe 10 mutations in this H5N1 virus would have made this a transmissible virus. And even though uh, I've been working on this, we have several papers on it, we can make it better transmissible 
but it appears still that it is in, in the laboratory. So I, I'm not trying to sort of make a bio threat agent or anything. It's just to show in the laboratory that we can make it more, but it still probably would need maybe hundreds of mutations. And that is still a very, I think, very unlikely that uh, this would naturally emerge into another pandemic strain. Okay, so uh, this brings us now to the last pandemic strain. And that's referred to as the swine origin, H1N1, and I will briefly uh, say why. It was first confirmed uh, in late April of 2009, and it was in Mexico. The Mexicans don't like to hear that, but it uh, could have happened anywhere. I mean, it's not clear whether the virus emerged there or not. Uh, and then the WHO, World Health Organization, declared it a pandemic, a global epidemic. And so we had, remember, we had only 1918, 1957, 1968 as pandemic strains, where the hemagglutinin changed. In this case here, some of us felt right in the beginning that it's not a real pandemic strain because the hemagglutinin hasn't changed from what we already have. Yeah? So it is sort of, I call it a 0.5 pandemic. Yeah? because the hemagglutinin neuromidase is similar to the H1N1 viruses, if you remember, which were still circulating, or are still circulating with us today. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as of the beginning of this year, uh, CDC uh, found uh, that we had uh, probably, I mean, this is an estimate, maybe a third in some populations, probably half of the young people have been infected. And uh, we had uh, lots of hospitalizations, actually more than usual. And we also had some uh, deaths related. And the unfortunate thing here was that it wasn't the oldies, but it was the younger population. And uh, still, we had about uh, 14,000 deaths associated with the uh, swine virus. So this is nothing uh, to sort of uh, uh, ignore. And uh, we had... Um, viruses which were particularly targeting the young one, pregnant women, etc. And so that was unusual, and I will explain why this uh, was the case. Uh, and uh, as I said here, I mean, particularly uh, younger than 65, usually with regular influenza, the older than 65 are affected, you know, die, are hospitalized. In the case of the swine virus, it was the other way around. Uh, very briefly, why was it uh, called a swine virus? And that uh, is, uh, the reason is that most of the genes are derived from swine viruses. So, so this is here, this new virus, which has the eight RNAs, and it's what we call a triple reassortant. It got its genes, and again, we don't know whether this happened in Mexico or anywhere else, or it happened in a pig, or happened in a human, or in another animal. And so it has these, I think, bluish, uh, 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 grayish genes. Uh, five of them came from uh, the Eurasian, uh, classical Eurasian swine virus, two from a an, an North American avian influenza virus, so the white ones here, and this yellow one here came from a human, H3N2. So this is uh, this swine virus, and particularly because it uh, retained or uh, got the hemagglutinin and the neuromidase on the outside, we are derived from uh, pigs. So uh, that's why it is referred to as a swine virus, even though the pork uh, industry is not happy about it. But um, it's irrelevant. I mean, scientifically, I mean, it could happen. It has not, okay, uh, uh, I think uh, the pork consumption went down a little bit, it had no, I mean, bearing on it. Uh, this is just uh, sort of bad press, really, and people don't understand that uh, this has nothing to do with, uh, uh, having uh, contaminated uh, food supplies. So uh, this uh, swine virus, over now as we call it actually, novel H1N1 virus, happens to have genes from three different viruses. Most of the genes came from uh, swine viruses, which we uh, have isolated from uh, uh, pig populations earlier on. So this is sort of why we call it that way and what it is. Again, we don't know where these, uh, where, where they really originated and how and what animal or what host really allowed this um, uh, reassortment. And the way this is, is that uh, two, uh, one cell gets infected by two of these viruses and then you get this mixing. So you have actually two to the eighth um, uh, uh, combination here. And uh, we have uh, this uh, triple reassortment here and that is uh, what this virus was all about. 
Now, uh, the swine virus uh, is something which uh, is unusual and compared particularly to the H5N1 virus, it transmits very, very well. And uh, it has the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, the H1 and the N1 uh, surface glycoproteins, which were similar to the viruses which were circulating before that. And what that means is that people have some immunity against this uh, virus. Uh, this is very specific, but also this new swine virus, H1N1 pandemic strain, doesn't have a particular gene. It's called PB1F2. It, uh, it just happens that my lab worked on that way before this came because all the other pandemic strains, 1918, 1957, 1968, has that gene. And uh, it ha happens that the 2009 virus doesn't have it. And since this is a virulence gene, it was pretty clear right from the beginning that probably this new pan pandemic strain is less virulent than uh, any of the other pandemic strains we had. And then very important, very early on, we realized that it is also sensitive to FDA-approved uh, anti-influenza anti drugs. So this is, uh, in a way, uh, very, very good news so that we do have what we refer to as herd immunity, meaning uh, the population at large has some immunity because we have been exposed to other H1N1 viruses so that uh, the new one can't really replicate that easily from one person to the other. It's missing one of the genes and then also is sensitive to uh, FDA approved uh, drugs. Now, in terms of uh, the death, you know, there is something which we should look at. So this is directly from the website from the Center for Disease Control. And those who can't see it down here are the seasons. So that's the last season from 2006, 2007, 2007, 2008. And the green uh, columns here are in the pediatric population. So this is from zero to 17 years old. And we're just looking here at the number of deaths, and we can see here sort of a number. And this is in the season of 2008, 2009. And then we start here in the summer of, uh, two, of 2009, and then uh, the fall of 2009 to 2010. And you can see here in violet or pinkish, whatever the color is here, in that pediatric population from zero to 17, we had more deaths than with regular seasonal influenza. So yes, the overall number of disease cases and the overall number of deaths in this H1N1 is lower, but unfortunately in that young population, uh, it actually was higher. And that is something we really uh, have to uh, sort of understand. And uh, let me sort of just uh, tell you that uh, we, are, we are trying to understand why is this virus so easily transmissible and what we are doing is, so this is just uh, giving you a, a little bit of a feeling that we, are, we, we have to use animal models. We obviously can't do it with medical students or it used to be that one could, could do that but not anymore. Uh, to find out what is sort of important in terms of transmission because that's sort of a, a major criterion. You know, H5N1 didn't transmit, H1N1 does very well. So what is it that uh, it makes? And so these are people uh, in my laboratory, uh, postdoctoral fellows and then a colleague from the Center of Disease Control. And so what we are trying to do is, so we have set up an environmental chamber here. So this is about uh, maybe 10 feet high. And then we have these cages here, which have open sides at the top and on one side. And then we infect one animal and one is uninfected. And so we have four pairs in here, uh, eight animals all together. And then we ask the question, what, under what condition, for example, which virus transmits easily from an infected to an uninfected? So they can't, con uh, they are not in direct contact. They can't lick each other. So it has to be an air, uh, uh, air transmission. And uh, by doing this, we can then measure, uh, for example, what, which gene in the, 19, in the 2009 virus is important, uh, taking it out and uh, putting it back, et cetera. And then also, for example, we can look at this in terms of the parameters which are important, temperature and relative humidity. So if you look here at 5 degrees centigrade, you can see that our transmission at relative humidity is much, much better. Uh, and at 30 degrees centigrade, 
uh, at any kind of relative humidity, we get zero transmission. And so this is sort of one of the explanations why we have mostly in the winter time when uh, the temperature is lower uh, as here and the relative humidity is lower, that we have more uh, transmission going on uh, with influenza viruses. Not exclusively as we learned uh, last year, but uh, this is, I think, a very good example of how we can study in the laboratory some of the parameters which are important uh, to understand uh, what makes uh, the virus uh, transmissible. And uh, this brings me to sort of the last point, namely that we can uh, make vaccines here. Let me go to this last slide here. Uh, we have, because that's the most important way how we can uh, dam in, how we can uh, sort of prevent uh, influenza virus infections. And that I think is something uh, uh, the government has really spent a lot of money last year uh, in terms of insurance against this new pandemic strain. Fortunately, uh, this virus turned out to be not as virulent uh, as we were uh, afraid of. Now, if we talk about influenza virus vaccines, we have two different kinds of vaccines. One is called, a, well, one is a killed, in, uh, inactivated, not inactive. So it is, one grows up the virus and then one in, in, inactivates it with formaldehyde and that is the injectable one. And then there is a live or attenuated, meaning a weakened virus, which can be uh, sprayed into the nose. So we have these two influenza viruses, uh, FDA licensed, FDA licensed in, uh, in this country, and uh, regular flu uh, vaccines actually contain uh, three different strains. And so this was last year's seasonal uh, virus uh, vaccine. And what you can look at here is, uh, so Brisbane means where the isolate was obtained, and this can be New York, this can be Washington. Uh, isolate number 10. The last number is when it was isolated. So this was fairly old vaccine uh, strain, 2007, 2007. And then another, it happened to be all three from Brisbane, but it's, that's really irrelevant. We have a B strain, we have uh, an H1 and an H3. And the Brisbane was the only one which was changed in 2009. So remember, the virus changes constantly. And uh, the uh, vaccine manufacturers don't want to change all three at the same time because it's much more expensive and more difficult. So in this case, in 2009, 2010, we had those three different strains and H1 and H3 and the B virus. However, uh, we were all surprised by having this new uh, pandemic H1 virus uh, occurring, and that was the uh, pandemic H1N1, novel H1N1 or swine origin, and that was the second vaccine, and, and in this case, we, we are, uh, 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 the uh, California isolate 7 from 2009 was used as a prototype strain. So last year was this sort of unfortunate situation that we had the regular vaccine containing the formulation containing three different uh, uh, viruses, but we also had a second uh, vaccine with a fourth strain, which was against the pandemic strain. And uh, as you remember, uh, last year uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, the, so the red curve here shows uh, visits for influenza like illness uh, and H1N1 vaccine distribution. So this shows here, and so this is started already fairly early in October, November. So this red curve here shows visits uh, in doctors' offices, and uh, this is really uh, reflecting when and how much of uh, influenza is going on. And then the blue curve here shows uh, the, uh, when we were able to ship out last year the H1N1 uh, uh, pandemic vaccine. And unfortunately, as you can see here, when the peak of the virus was around October, November last year, uh, the shipment just started. Then it takes about two weeks until we make en enough antibodies against the vaccine. So the actual effect, uh, the efficacy uh, rate would be another shift of about two weeks. So last year, despite the fact we spent, uh, despite the fact that we spent a lot of money, it wasn't really helpful because the vaccines were not shipped when we had already the peak of the virus replication uh, of, of the virus. Uh, 
preponderance and the uh, virus circulation. So this is sort of uh, demonstrates that uh, we are always sort of limping behind uh, somewhat in terms of um, uh, our ability to really sort of uh, uh, catch up with a new pandemic strain. I think the next time around uh, we will be better, we will be able to shift this blue curve uh, more to the left and uh, be able to actually have something uh, which can also be uh, delivered uh, in time. And uh, to end on a good note is that uh, this year, so this is now 2010, 2011, uh, so that is the current vaccine, which I really encourage everyone to take, uh, contains now, and, and all the strains are very different from, are different from the uh, last uh, one, uh, and so we have the uh, new swine virus here is an H1N1. We have a different H3N2, also a very recent one, and a B strain. And so now we are back to sort of the formulation having only three uh, different uh, strains in the vaccine and this pandemic strain. And so that's sort of the second important message is that this pandemic H1 uh, strain has become sort of a regular seasonal one so that we now uh, really are waiting for, uh, hopefully, uh, never, never say never, that this will be a regular seasonal year here where the pandemic H1 from last year has morphed into a regular seasonal one. And so that we have uh, just H1 and 1, H3 and 2, and the Brisbane and the old seasonal one probably uh, will not be around. And so we don't need four different strains, but just those three. And from what we know uh, already, and we have a little bit of knowledge from the Southern Hemisphere because they have winter during our August, so that this is really holding up and that the flu season now will be sort of a regular seasonal consisting uh, uh, of these kinds of strains and that this will be uh, what we uh, will uh, experience as we go into November, December into the flu season. Okay, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, and I'm also sticking around if someone wants to uh, know a little bit more about it. Thank you very much. What would you expect, I mean, if it works, working in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you should have fewer children, I suppose, fewer pediatric cases. Uh, uh, yes, here. exactly. I think uh, partly because we probably have not immunized really enough, but uh, they have been naturally infected, most of them, so that they would be really most likely, I would predict exactly what you are saying, that there would be less of uh, pediatric uh, problems, the fewer uh, uh, pediatric so problems. Folks that are vaccinated or even, even, even those that are not? Even though, because, because the virus has sort of infected quite a lot, yeah? Okay? Yeah. So that it becomes... Naturally, so that really becomes now a, a, just a regular seasonal one without the problem with uh, 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 women who are pregnant, etc. cetera. Yeah. Question about H5N1. Yeah. Um, what seemed to prevent it from being transmitted uh, among humans uh, was the fact that it lodges pretty much deep in the lung, as I understand, as opposed to up high in the lung, which yeah. is seasonal. That's a one, one theory. Uh, what do you think it would take to have H5N1 migrate to the upper respiratory where it can more easily be translated in some way? The, the fear is that it would be a couple of mutations only, but I think it would really need more than a couple. Yeah? Because we have tinkered around with these viruses in the laboratory, and just the simple ones haven't done it. Yeah? Is that enough, though, to move it up high? Uh, it also has to be expelled, so it has to be able to be, by breathing, you know, come out. And that's not yet clear what that is, you know, what, what it takes to do that, yeah? Yes? Uh, I've, always been, I've always heard that antibiotics don't do much against viruses, so is it, is it such a good idea to administer uh, yeah. antibiotics yeah. Okay, so we have, as major infectious agents, we have on one hand viruses, and then we have even bi much bigger uh, bacteria, okay? Antibiotics really don't do anything against viruses. So when you go to the doctor and, and he tells you you have the flu and he gives you an antibiotic, he does it because he wants to make you happy, yeah? But it really, it really doesn't help, yeah? 
the only um, reason why one might want to give antibiotics if there is a super infection with, bacterial, uh, with bacteria. And that is very, very rare. Yeah? So it is not frequent. So in, in essence, it is not really good medicine to give someone who has flu uh, an antibiotic. Okay? Only in the very rare cases where there is a super infection. Yes. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, for the vaccination, do you prefer the, the injectable or the nasal? Um, okay. I saw you said one was inactive and one was... No, no, not, not in a, inactivated. Inactivated. So uh, one, is, one is being given by injection. That's the inactivated or killed one. And the live one is given uh, through the nose. And what that does, it gives you local immunity and also probably longer lasting immunity, okay? The, the only problem is that the virus, is, uh, 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 this vaccine is not approved for people older than 49 and younger than two years of age, okay? Are you more likely to have side effects at all from the uh, Both of them are absolutely safe, really. The, the reason why it, it, uh, the FDA didn't approve it is, is complex. There were not enough numbers for the older than 49. So it's not really, it sounds like safety, yeah? But uh, it is really, both of them are extraordinarily safe and uh, really, I think, just take them, okay? Yes. Um, do you believe that um, because doctors overprescribe antibiotics for viral infections or any other cause as well, do you think that the production and increased use of antivirals will promote even more um, diversity within viruses? Yeah. Okay, so the, the excessive use of antibiotics yeah, has certainly led to the emergence of resistant bacteria, and certainly the use of a lot of antivirals will lo lead to, more, uh, to, a, to a larger number of resistant strains, and we know this from HIV, etc. That's unfortunately true. On the other hand, we don't have a chance. You know? And the, the challenge is to make better antibiotics, and the challenge is to make better antivirals. OK? Yes? There was a lot of discussion about the process that we use to create, produce vaccines, cell-based versus egg-based during the pandemic. And I was just kind of wondering what the status yeah. of that is. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, all the vaccines here are all in the U.S. are all made by eggs. So in other words, they are embryonated eggs. So, so we, we just a fertilizer, uh, one takes a fertilized egg and injects the virus in there, and then the virus grows in the allantoic uh, cells, uh, epithelial cells. And then at the end of 48, 72 hours, one takes it out and then spins down and gets the virus. So that's the egg production, and that is a 50-year-old process. It uh, takes about one egg per dose. So if we have 300 million doses, we need 300 million eggs, and that's quite a lot. And the price of eggs goes up about uh, a cent or something when that is being done. Yeah? It would be much better to produce the virus in tissue culture. However, uh, the, that has to be an FDA-approved process, and that is a little bit more difficult. We have not, at this point, we have not made any progress. The 2010, 2011, and I guarantee you the 2011, 2012 will be also all egg grown. So there is no um, FDA license insight. Uh, to go off of her question, uh, do you think the US is and some other countries' insistence on or focus on anti not just antibiotics, and, but like all the hand sanitizers and all the, you know, cleaning products that are, I, in my opinion, excessively overused in our society. Is that leading to some of these problems because we don't build up an immunity to certain, um, you know, diseases that we would have built up an immunity to naturally? Okay, l let me take the first one. The last one first, okay? So I don't subscribe to that uh, idea. You know? I mean, we, uh, there, is an, uh, there is some idea that if we don't get exposed to a lot of different viruses, our immune system is not as good. I'm not so sure. I think we get enough exposed to the different bacteria and viruses so that I think our immune system has to work even in a 
clean a society as ours as compared to Pakistan. Uh, well, uh, let me not. Uh, 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 um, so, uh, so I, I'm not sure this is really uh, will will be is a big uh, a big factor. Now, in terms of, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot the first point. Like enhancement. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, influenza is not transmitted by handshaking, even though uh, the uh, 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 CDC says we should wash our hands. I'm not not against washing hands, but uh, okay, but for other reasons. Yeah, it's for flu. It probably uh, flu is not very stable on doorknobs. Yeah, and it is really a virus which is transmitted through the air. Yeah, so that the washing of hands. Yeah, what it does is it. Uh, there are studies actually when you have a face mask yeah, and wash your hands, you are sort of keeping, a, there's social distancing involved with that as well and being more aware and not coming too close, etc. So those are factors which are probably operating in terms of reducing the transmission. But the transmission of flu as compared to other, I mean HIV is not transmitted through the air. Yeah? So, uh, other things we have to do about HIV transmission, okay, <laughs> I mean, the avoiding. But uh, for flu, it's really a, a disease transmitted through the air so that the, the act of washing hands, yeah, is probably not that helpful, despite what the CDC says, yeah. And, and I, they, they just actually published last uh, uh, night, you know, the uh, new guidelines, and they are sort of a little bit more wishy-washy about uh, washing hands, yeah. But, uh, I think this is a, again, I think it's good for other reasons, but for influenza specifically, it may not be something which is uh, preventing transmission because it's transmitted in a different way. Yes? There was an article last year in the New York Times saying that women found it sufficient in your response to adapt the dose of the flu vaccine and they have less side effects by getting a smaller dose of flu uh, I think uh, it's probably perfectly fine to take half, you know. Uh, so it, it's really, uh, on the other hand, the side effects are so minimal, you know. I mean, it's a little bit of reddening, you know, and maybe a little bit of stuffiness in the nose with the killed versus the, the life. I'm not sure that this is a real big issue, you know. Is it the year Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking as far as, you know, the policies that we Yes, I think yeah, the, the only thing is, you know, if you take half, then you will have the, the majority of people will be perfectly protected, but there may be a small, when I mean, you come down to the curve, of, of a small percentage of people who really would have needed double the, I mean, the, the, the regular amount. So the reason that amount is given is that 98% then are being are captured. You know? So if you go down to lower levels, you may lose some of the people in terms of making a good immune response. But it's a very, I mean, it's a very safe vaccine, really. I mean, this is, I mean, has been around for 50 years, you know, we are used to egg uh, proteins and all of that. So this is not a, you know, uh, it's a really safe one, you know. Well, what is the, uh, the time frame, the time you got your eyes to, to the time you were able to yes. Uh, okay, so it's really half a year right now. In February, the FDA makes a decision what, what strain is being, should be used, okay, so the, 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 the California, whatever, is being, so that's the first or second week of February, and then uh, these strains have to be manipulated a little bit to make them grow better, and then uh, the actual process of growing it in eggs starts about May, June, then they make it for two months and then the distribution. So it takes really half a year. Now last year, I'm talking about last year's quick, quick. Yeah, yeah that was quicker. it was not, but it also involved 300 million doses. So it wasn't really, the, the six months were still six months. Yeah. So it was really from April to October. I mean, maybe five months, okay? It's, but it, it not, not, not by much. And it, it was, and, and the reason was that we needed 300 million, yeah? There was a big question whether we would only have 150 million, but then who, do, who gets it and who doesn't get it? So that's a big question, yeah? So the, the, the idea was making really 300 million, yeah? Yes? 
If you were to make a list and prioritize it, um, viruses that we would we should be Excellent. worried about oh. um, in terms of an epidemic or even a plague, would you rank influenza as one of the top ones that we should keep our eye on? Absolutely, in terms of its potential. If we look at the 1918 pandemic, I mean, that was something, even AIDS, yeah, it, uh, we, we lost 50 million people uh, over a 25-year period, yeah? and there it was within a three-month three period yeah, in, in 1918. So yes, uh, a regular seasonal flu is probably not as high as HIV, but the question is, we don't know yeah, whether there, are a, a, there will be a new pandemic strain. So that's why I think influenza ranks up uh, high in uh, sort of uh, preparing against such an event, et cetera, okay? What, what other viruses do you think um, we should prioritize? I mean, there on one hand, we have the biodefense yeah, uh, category or rubric. And uh, in, uh, on, on the natural viruses, I mean, I think we have very good vaccines against mumps, measles, rubella, uh, 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 vac um, uh, uh, herpes virus, some of the herpes virus, papillomavirus vaccine is very good. We don't have anything against cytomegalovirus, for example, which is very important. Uh, and uh, I think we, we need uh, virus, we need uh, good rotavirus vaccines, which are being uh, made right now. So I think it's, it's um, fairly clear what kind of uh, vaccines we really need. And uh, a lot of the uh, uh, efforts both in academia and industry are really directed against that. Good. Thank you, Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.